In this section, we're going to talk about orchestrators. And if you look at the public cloud vendors that are out there, they call these more fancy things like infrastructure as a service, or platform as a service, or containers as a service, or even now a newer thing which is functions as a service. Um, but really, these are all different examples of the same thing, as, which is what we call an orchestrator. Um, and the purpose of the orchestrator is that it manages a cluster's life cycle. And a cluster is really a set of personal computers, if you're deploying your code directly onto hardware, metal, sometimes we call that bare metal, or it could be a set of virtual machines that are running on those physical machines. And usually for most cloud providers, they use virtual machines, they don't use bare metal, but there are some that offer bare metal. And the orchestrator, as I say, is going to manage these sets of machines and their life cycle. That is creating them for you, destroying them for you, uh, scaling them up, that is adding more, scaling them down, that is removing some. Right? They will manage the networking, make sure that all the virtual machines are networked together so that they can see each other. And they isolate that traffic. So any other virtual machines that may be on the same physical machines have no access to the network traffic that's being sent between your cluster's virtual machines. The orchestrator also monitors the health. So they are constantly checking to see, is your hardware functioning properly? Is your virtual machine functioning properly? Is your application up and running properly? Some orchestrators allow you to get involved with the health. So sometimes health can be uh, service specific. Like um, if my service takes more than one second to give a reply back, I want to consider it to be unhealthy. Right? The orchestrator can't know what a good a period of time for a reply is for your service. So you might want to take on some of the role of doing health monitoring yourself and reporting to the orchestrator health. And then the orchestrator will orchestrate things like upgrades for you. You'll, you will tell the orchestrator, I want to upgrade my code from version one now to version two. And then it will go to all the virtual machines and replace the code that's on them. Um, I already mentioned that the orchestrator will manage scaling, that is adding more VMs to your cluster or removing VMs from your cluster. Uh, and it also controls the deployment and running of your service code. So the orchestrator does a lot for you. Sometimes it has extensibility points where you can get involved in it. Um, like maybe you can report load, for example, so that it has a better sense of the noisy neighbor scenario. And you can say to the orchestrator, well, mine I'm processing thousands of requests per second, and maybe this other service happens to be on the same VM, is also handling thousands of requests per second, and so the orchestrator can separate those apart. Um, so those are just some of the examples of what an orchestrator can do for you, and there's lots of different kinds of them, and uh, in an ideal world, you would pick one, use it, and then maybe over time, you could just move to a different one if you want to. In an ideal world, you wouldn't be changing your code to do this. Right? So the way you write your code and, and architect your code in an ideal world would not be tied to a specific orchestrator. A lot of times today that's not the case and you are designing for a specific orchestrator. But I think that the way trends are going that over time the, uh, the orchestrator is going to fade more into the background and you will be able to write your code so that it's more orchestrator agnostic. At the bottom of the slide, I have an animation here to kind of go through some of the scenarios of what an orchestrator does. The big rectangle is some data center region somewhere on the planet. And inside that region, you have deployed your code. So you have written your code somewhere on your desktop computer, and you've taken that code, and you have gone and uploaded into some service code repository that lives within some data center somewhere. Then you've told the orchestrator to go and spin up a bunch of either PCs or virtual machines. In this case, we're spinning up four. These four machines make up your cluster. The orchestrator is then going to surround these machines with a virtual network. That allows all your PCs or VMs to be able to communicate with each other in a secure way so that other PCs or VMs within the same data center are not able to see the network traffic for your cluster and vice versa. Then the orchestrator is going to take the service code out of the repository and it's going to go and deploy it onto all those PCs or virtual machines. So now your code is up and running on these VMs and now you can go and handle client requests that are coming into the data center uh, from your code and send replies back. 
Uh, so a client request would come in, it typically goes to a load balancer. The load balancer then directs the traffic to one of the PCs or VMs that's part of your cluster. Your service code gets that request, does some processing, and then ultimately sends a reply back. Now what I just showed here was a, uh, your code crashing. Let's see it again because it's a fun animation. So there in the bottom left corner is your code running on a VM, but let's say your code gets an unhandled exception and so your code crashes. Well, the job of the orchestrator is to detect that automatically, and the orchestrator should execute some operation in order to bring your code back up, right? And this is to keep yourself resilient. Now, for that moment when your code is down, the load balancer might detect that, and the load balancer would direct new incoming requests from the internet to one of the other three virtual machines that are part of the cluster. And then when the orchestrator brings that fourth code back up, then it would go and notify the load balancer again that there are four machines capable of handling the requests, and the load balancer would now direct requests to all four. So in other words, when your code went down, there was a loss of scale. There were only three machines capable of handling the client requests. But when the orchestrator repaired your node, brought your code back up, then the load balancer was able to send the request to all four, and the proper scale was restored. Another example of what an orchestrator does, is it handles a machine crashing. So here I show the machine on the top right, let's say the whole machine just vanishes. Maybe a power supply goes bad, maybe a network cable goes bad and it can't be reached, right? But the orchestrator is supposed to detect this automatically. Now if it's a true hardware failure, the orchestrator can't fix hardware and bring it back into the cluster. So instead, the orchestrator will find another machine somewhere in the data center and bring that machine up automatically copy the service code from the repository onto the new machine and then notify the load balancer that there's this new machine that has joined the cluster. And so now the load balancer can again get direct the traffic to any of these four machines. But for a period of time there, there was a loss of one machine, so you were running at reduced scale, but still, hand, still handling incoming client requests until we went on, the orchestrator found a fourth machine and then scaled you back up to the desired scale. Right? And the, these are the kinds of things that orchestrators do for you, and it's, it's really a fantastic service to take advantage of. Then, of course, you might just want to scale up. It might be that time of year, or maybe time of day even, where more client requests are hitting, and these four machines aren't able to handle the full load. So, some orchestrators support an auto-scaling mechanism, which I'll talk more about later, but they can go and add, if they see that there's a lot of load on your four machines, the orchestrator can automatically insert a fifth machine into the cluster. Um, even if your orchestrator doesn't allow this to happen automatically, you can certainly do it manually. You might say, well, just during the Christmas season, I want to go and have another machine in this cluster, and you can tell the orchestrator to scale up. And then the orchestrator will add a fifth machine to the cluster in this case, copy the service code to it, notify the load balancer, and now the load balancer can send the traffic to any of the five machines. And of course you can scale up to six, seven, eight, you know, a hundred machines. And then when the time of year is over, or when you don't need them all, you can go and scale back down. 